Okay, let's make a start. I think we, we have a, a good audience, almost 80 people joined. Um, welcome back to Sustainability Superheroes. This is our second season after quite an extended break. Uh, last year, we covered quite a range of topics from competitive advantage, the business case of landowners, low carbon business transformation, and many other topics. And we have an equally exciting lineup this season. So since we closed last season, we've seen some very progressive changes in sustainability, uh, not least with the Environment Act 2021 for biodiversity net gain coming into force next week. I'm sure the world is watching the UK to see if this pioneering framework can result in real positive change and stimulate similar methods to enhance biodiversity in other countries. We also saw the launch of TNFD, the European Restoration Bill finally went through its last stage in the European Union, and we also saw the COP28 being led in the Middle East. In this season, we're going to be talking with various different organisations to explore how different sectors are adapting to emerging regulations, innovation, and all striving towards a more sustainable future. We'll be speaking with leading developers and environmental contractors to better see how they're adapting to uh, new approaches from the conventional methods. Uh, we'll be speaking with consultants around uh, natural capital and enterprises, how they can embrace TNFD into the future. I'll be delving as well into emerging regulations over time as well. So some great topics, and I hope you'll come and join me for those conversations over the next couple of months. But back to today, please give a very warm welcome to our guest today, Helen Newell from Barrett Developments. Barrett's had a commitment to 100% BNG action plans in place before 2024. So a little ahead of, of, of the rest of the market. We'll be talking about biodiversity and how, how Barrett's have prepared as well as the developments to enhance biodiversity through development. Helen is Group Head of Biodiversity for Barrett. She's had 20 years plus experience on biodiversity strategies, including nine years on the uh, Fauna and Flora International Business and Biodiversity Team. She joined Barrett's in 2017 to deliver biodiversity and ecology policy and managed a long-term partnership with RSPB. Helen was a core part of the development of BNG Practical Guide, uh, published by SAIM, the Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment. I'm, I'm glad that we got all those ones in there from the acronyms, so that I could remember them all. And that also fed into the British Stamps as well. And she is also the chair of the Future Home for BNG Oversight Group, and these and all things biodiversity for Barrett's. So please welcome Helen. And Thanks, Helen, I, could we just start with giving us a brief overview? I'm sure most people have heard of Barrett's, but if you could give us a brief overview of the business. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so yeah, Barrett is one of the, the largest volume house builders in the UK. So we usually build somewhere in the region of about 17,000 new homes every year. Um, and on top of that, we are also the UK's leading national sustainable house builder. We received the gold award for the eighth consecutive year from Next Generation. It's, this is an annual sustainability benchmark of the 25 largest house builders in the UK. So, yeah, we're very proud of that uh, to get that again last year. And I think most folks are, are probably familiar with the idea of building homes from one perspective. But I'd love to get your take on what's the process from perspective for new land to hand it over the front door, please. Yeah, I think there's probably quite a few people on here today listening in that probably know this process a whole lot better than I do. I'm an ecologist, I'm not a planner, and I'm not a developer by trade. I sneaked in the back door about six years ago. But the development life cycle can have a, a few different entry points for us as a developer. We sometimes start out right at the beginning with the landowner, working with them to secure planning on a site that doesn't have any planning at all on it. But sometimes we purchase land that already has planning obligations on it. So there's two different entry points for us as a developer. But essentially, once we've met all of those local and national development policies, and then we've designed an appropriate layout that meets those, the construction process basically kicks in and becomes a very busy place. Uh, from then on in. Um, and our first customers that move in sometimes move in before the site is completed. But once it's all done, our homeowners then take on obviously full management responsibility of that site going forward. 
I hope that kind of is a kind of brief intro to to the it's much more complicated than I've laid out there. That's the basics. And at what stage does biodiversity or, or, or ecology come into this? Do you, do you start at the very beginning or does it pick up part way through? I guess it does depend on that entry point, really. But ideally, and I would say yes, but ideally you're trying to get that biodiversity element in right from the start. So we'll ask our land and planning teams to really identify what the biodiversity constraints and opportunities with a site uh, is going to be as early as possible. So when they start looking at a, 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 an area that they would they think is going to be suitable for, for development, what are those constraints and opportunities around biodiversity? So that involves our ecology consultants right from day one. But we also talk about biodiversity pretty much all the way through. So an example of that is we talk about biodiversity uh, with our homeowners as well. Through our sales teams, they're going to be discussing some of the features that we've implemented into those developments. Development. So, for example, swift nesting bricks, hedgehog highways. These are sorts of discussion points in in our, our sales arenas. We also have wildlife friendly show home gardens so we can talk to our homeowners about the different types of things they can do to attract wildlife into their new home. Fantastic. And we move on to the sort of key challenges, if you like, of uh, being uh, making homes more sustainable. But conservation regulations have been part of development and planning consenting for quite some time now and continue to evolve. Uh, I'm curious to know that what where are the pressures coming from? What are the different stakeholders that you see? Do you, do you see customers or local communities saying that they want to see more sustainable homes, particularly when it comes to biodiversity? Or mm-hmm. is it coming from investors? Are they, are, or is it that side? Or is it purely driven by regulations and authorities which are asking for that sustainability and biodiversity angle? It's yeah, it's definitely come from a whole range of different stakeholders for sure. Our homeowners that have swift nesting bricks in their homes have always talked quite positively about those. So we know there's an interest there. Um, and obviously our local communities are are always keen to ensure that the, there's appropriate mitigation and appropriate compensation um, after development has been put in place around the environment. They're always very keen to ensure that we are we, we take their local environment very responsibly and very seriously. Um, yeah, more recently, investors have started to talk to us about biodiversity and what we're doing about biodiversity. And you mentioned TNFD there, the Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosures, which isn't easy to say. And they're starting to think about how companies like Barrett and others start to assess their dependencies on biodiversity. So they've got they've got the, they've got an interest from that point of view. But actually, more recently, Barrett undertook a materiality assessment with a whole range of stakeholders, and one of the things that came out of that was this interest and keenness around local ecosystems as being important yeah really a a growing area of interest Uh, and I think that's been fueled by a number of things but this awareness that there is a significant loss of biodiversity in the UK uh, and I'm sure most people on this call will, will, will know the numbers and biodiversity is important to us in so many ways and people are starting to to clock on to that it's not just Uh, It's not just nice to have outside. It's actually fundamental to our health and mental being. It's fundamental to our economy. So these things are really starting to drive the biodiversity agenda up up the ladder, making it far more uh, relevant and and prevalent as well. And can you you say a little bit more about the the requirements today? What's driving that need? Where where do you see that really coming from right now? So then... The requirements that we've got today are EU and UK based kind of legislations protecting species, protecting certain species, protecting certain habitats and those areas that we consider to be ecologically important. So triple SIs and so on and so forth. But now we've got biodiversity net game regulations on board and they're coming into force on Monday, as you mentioned, in England. But there are similar drives in in, in Scotland and Wales. But this new regulation isn't just focusing on specific species, specific habitats. It's basically trying to protect all habitats and encourage everybody to not just protect those habitats, to enhance them and also to create new habitats. So it's much more wide ranging than, than just uh, that looking at specifics. Absolutely. And um, uh, how, how do you see the, the need for regulations to an extent? Is that, you know, how they come about? I, I know you guys have been working in this space when it was voluntary, I guess, to an extent. Is there a need for it to be regulated or can the voluntary market kind of drive it along by itself? 
Yeah, it's a really good question. I guess the, the legislation came into play because, of, yes, you mentioned it was voluntary to begin with, but I think there was a real groundswell of optimism about this being a tool that could really help to reverse this trend in biodiversity loss. Um, fundamental to the biodiversity net gain process is what we call the mitigation hierarchy. And the first step on that hierarchy is to avoid impact in the first place. And it's a really important thing to think about um, because protecting that biodiversity, not chipping away at it uh, as much as we possibly can is a key way to, to reverse that trend. And then putting back more than what you had in the first place is obviously going to help us to start levelling that trajectory and hopefully um, sending it into an upward curve as well. Do we need legislation that's one of those things, I think it's definitely got to play part of, of this whole picture, but it needs to be well considered um, and, and, and based on real experience and, and have that kind of pragmatism about it. And the only way you can do that is in consultation. I think there has been a lot of consultation around this piece of legislation. But I also believe in um, finding the right business case, actually, to motivate a business into action. I've worked on business and biodiversity strategies for, for a very long time. So finding that business case is important beyond legislation, making sure that it, it, it really that the solution fits seamlessly into that business and becomes business as usual. So, yeah, legislation has a part to play, but there's more to it than just legislation, I think, if recognizing that biodiversity is important to your business it's important to your customers um, and that's how you're going to get that kind of yeah that movement towards doing, doing uh, it, it, embedding biodiversity into the business i'm, I'm guessing as well that the, the the purpose of the regulation drives that consistency of approach as well and like, you know yeah. what they're doing things which is common across wherever you are in england at the moment yeah yeah it's consistency isn't it it, it definitely supports a level playing field and that is definitely as a business that's very important for us yeah definitely so uh, as we near the end of i was going to say end of january but it is as we're into february now the uk statutory metric goes live i know it was delayed a few weeks towards the back end there but uh, how do you see that how is that impacted barrett's and um, how do you, what was this sort of intended positive steps for nature well, have you seen the, any challenges or adoption issues in putting this in place? Because you guys are a little ahead of um, Monday. You've got action plans in place. What can we, what, what have been the teething problems? Uh, I, okay, so yeah, we've had a commitment in place uh, for quite a while, as you mentioned, uh, around achieving uh, minimum 10% on newly submitted sites. So from January 23, all of our sites um, have had to identify within their design how we were going to achieve a 10% net gain or more. Um, so it's not going to mean a massive change for us. I think the biggest change for us is really getting our heads around what the new steps, the new processes are to be able to ensure that we are legally compliant, basically. So we've been doing this voluntarily, but now, of course, we've got some, we've got new regulations that we need to follow. I think it's really going to be more of an issue for, I guess, ecology consultants, landscape architects, contractors as well. I think there's a there's big changes afoot from the way that they normally do business. Uh, and in some of those sectors, quite a bit of capacity building is going to be required as well. Um, they now need to produce new documentation that probably wasn't required before. Uh, and all of that needs to be submitted alongside our planning application. So things like habitat management and monitoring plans need to involve a number of different sectors in that to be able to complete those. And OK, that's a voluntary a document but I think it's it clearly outlines how we should be delivering biodiversity net gain on our site and then post planning we then have our biodiversity gain plans that need to be submitted so there's these new steps that everybody's going to have to get their heads around adoption issues yeah I think look with everything that's new there's always going to be adoption issues there's always going to be issues it takes time for new processes to settle in 
I think there's still some areas of guidance that we need and we need to roll that out, that, that new guidance with all the stakeholders that are involved in biodiversity in the game. So local planning authorities, developers, everybody needs to get their heads around this new guidance as well. And of course, there's the key issues, I think, that we've talked about at length, local plan, planning authority capacity, the fact that we there isn't a huge ready market for biodiversity offsets at the moment. But there are ways that we can change that and mitigate for some of those issues. And it, it, it's about having those conversations with your consultants, uh, your landscape cons- your architects, your, your ecology consultants as much as, as early as possible. And having good communications with local planning authorities as well, um, making sure that our plans are really well considered and they're not. Um, blue sky thinking they're actually grounded in truth and what's actually possible and having all of that sorted prior to 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 submitting for planning I think is really going to help that transparency uh, to get over some of these hurdles uh, in the first instance. Absolutely when you think back the last couple of years there's any particular areas of a voluntary version of BNG which was challenging to, to manage or mitigate or is So I think one of the biggest challenges we have being such a large company and having lots of different function groups within the company, one of the biggest challenges was making sure the guidance that we've produced, so this is off the back of Syria and CIE guidance and the BSI guidance, we had, we we developed some that was was appropriate for our, our, for Barrett, is making sure that guidance is appropriate for each of those different function groups, because from land and planning all the way through to our sales teams, everybody's got some part to play in delivering a successful biodiversity net gain program. So having that clear line of sight and 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 um, guidance that spoke specifically to those different groups was a bit of a challenge, but we've we've got there. And it is about having that regular conversation, regular updates on how things are going. And uh, as changes come along, what needs to change in terms of our process? And we've seen, I think, over the last couple of years, BNG has, as you said, gone through a consultation stage. It's changed and adapted quite a few times in the last Mm -hmm. two years, three years. I think I remember version two is probably where I I first saw it. And I think since then, version three, 3.1, 4, now the statutory metric. No statutory. Anticipating any future changes. It's been such a long period of consultation. So yeah, it's... and I, I, th- I think it has to be. We've had it's been good to have that level of engagement in it, though, because it's got us to a place where we are as confident as we can be in that metric. And uh, and as far as I know, that metric is to be static for the next five years. Uh, I'm pretty sure that it's going to be relooked at again in five years' time. But this is it now. This is a statutory metric that we're going to be using. I think there's going to be updates to guidance potentially, but that's but it's not the metric for the next five years. And let me ask you one last question about you guys working in Scotland and in Wales as well, which the VNG statutory metric is very much designed for England. Yeah. Can you see anything else emerging there which is similar, different? In Scotland and Wales. Um, in Scotland, what they talk about is net positive effects for biodiversity. And in Wales, they talk about ecosystem integrity. Very similar in in, in kind of the approaches they took in there in the MPF4 and, and planning policy Wales. They reference the mitigation hierarchy. So it's based off the same um, theory or ethos, if you like, that the, the the application of mitigation hierarchy is key. The difference is that neither of these, they haven't adopted a, a calculator yet, a metric, essentially, to measure what your losses are and what the potential gains are. But there is a, there's, I, I guess in Scotland, they talk a lot around natural capital and the importance of, of, of that. And of course, this ecosystem integrity piece that Wales talk about, points to ecosystem services and ecosystem benefits as well it's actually it's actually bigger in some respects than what we've got in england but what's great about in england is that we can measure apples with apples not perfect all the time but it's given us this ability to be transparent about what we started with and what we're ending with yeah maybe you end up with a fusion of the two i say at some point but yeah I, I'm guessing there's going to be a whole bunch of folks on the call here which are going to ask the obvious question, which is, is this going to make homes more expensive? Uh, is the trade-off right? 
Yeah, I mean, there's lots of different factors that that go into what a house actually costs. Uh, I do, I guess, what I can say is that the cost that the homeowner pays for maintenance and upkeep of their development should remain consistent. So that's the bit that we know more about is really what that cost is going to be. Uh, and it should remain consistent from what it is now. And although the the implementation of some of these habitats and um, the planting, the new types of habitats may be different to what you would expect in a traditional uh, pre-BNG requirement time, what that might be. That longer term management piece should be the same, if not cheaper, actually, because it's less intensive than some of the more traditional landscaped areas. So you should be able to see a, see a, a, a balance in that respect. But what's important for us, I think, to remember is that whatever plans that we pass on to our homeowners, so our biodiversity game plans, that long term 30 year uh, look at our development, we need to make sure that it's actually achievable. Um, and it's that it's right for that area as well. So we're not importing habitats that just don't belong in that situation, that they fit with that local ecosystem uh, and that they are not just insurmountable in terms of the, the game that they're going to bring. We've got to be very realistic about that. Fantastic. And I know that I've heard certainly in the marketplace there's been talk about offsets, biodiversity offsets, we can see offsets, offsets being part of the market design. Do you, do you think that they'll be part of the major delivery strategy here, or do you see BNG being mainly developed on the site itself? What's the balance right here between those two mechanisms for delivering the action plan? Yeah, it's a good question again. I think biodiversity offsets, definitely part of the picture. I think they're quite an important part of this picture too. But we need to demonstrate that we've applied the mitigation hierarchy to its fullest on every single site. So we can't just go straight to an offset. We've got to think about um, what's important in the site in the first place. What do we need to avoid impacting? And then what's right to be putting back? And if that doesn't get us to the 10% the or more, if it doesn't get us to that, that required 10%, then we've got a great opportunity to start funding some really great strategic conservation projects. We, we need to make sure that those are available for us to, to mitigate for those losses that we have on site. And I, I think we've got, we've got the, the Lawton principles talk about bigger, better, more joined up. That's what our, our offset should be contributing to, this expanse of, of habitat for wildlife in and amongst our countryside. It's, it's a really great opportunity to fund that but not forgetting that the mitigation hierarchy is key to this whole thing and that avoidance of impact in the first place. We also have to be conscious of land availability as well. There's lots of different priorities and pressures on land at the moment. So we need to have, a, I think we need to have a lot more um, and, and better strategic thinking when it comes to biodiversity offsets, especially when the light of the rise in carbon offsets and nutrient mitigation as well. There's all these different things, but yeah, we, we definitely see them as part of the solution but not the only thing out there we need to concentrate on our sites also just thinking about our sites as well by taking everything off site we're losing the opportunity to create these amazing spaces for people on their development and um, that place making piece is really important and uh, i mentioned that mental health and uh, and physical well-being as well that that contact with nature is, is so important so if we were just to go and put it all off site then we're missing an opportunity for our, our homeowners to enjoy nature right there on their development that's a great point i'm going to ask one last question in this section around monitoring and i know that the answer is probably more about the transition from ownership from yourselves to the next uh, the homeowner the, the management development company but could you say a little bit about what happens once you've built the habitat once you built the homes you paid for it who monitors how does that process work what's the next stage yeah, the monitoring aspect will need to have been considered when we've submitted our biodiversity game plan. There's going to have to be some uh, identification of who's going to be managing for the long term uh, those spaces within our development. Um, yeah, that's going to have to be determined quite early on what that monitoring process is going to be and agreed with local planning authority as well. Um, but yeah, as you mentioned, it's fundamentally that's going to be something that happens post um, post Barrett or post any developer uh, having been on that site. Just, just, sorry, just another point on monitoring actually. Um, it's 
it, again, one of those things that we're going to have to start. The reason it's really important as well is because we need to identify that this is actually working and that we've got the right systems in place um uh to to uh, and 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 therefore we can start to improve or or change the way things are going if it doesn't seem to be working and i think there's got to be some recognition of adaptive management if monitoring identifies that those issues are, are, are arising and definitely in the light of climate change as well 30 years is a long time so we're going to have to think about how those that monitoring speaks to what happens on the ground and how things can be changed if it looks like things are, haven't been haven't progressed as as they should have and just building on that can you say a little bit more you hand this over to a management company how are they involved in that management plan are they do you create the plan and they once you've built the houses you appoint the first management company and they just inherit that and the liabilities so yeah they, so Sorry. How do they feed into the plan? Yeah, so currently that's how it happens. We would create the landscape plan and hand it over and somebody would manage it. Uh, and that would happen quite late in the day. I think there's a, a definite move to try and incorporate their considerations much earlier on in, in the process. It's important because they're the ones who are going to be actually delivering it longer term. They've got to be happy that it's achievable. In a way, we're talking about plans being achievable for the homeowners, making sure that they are. But it's, it's for the other stakeholders involved as well. And to have that expertise earlier on in those conversations is going to have, we're going to have to do that, I think. It's going to change. Much more collaborative approach to mm. the design to next time. Yeah, yeah, collaboration is key to all of this, for sure. I've talked about landscape architects and contractors and ecologists and management companies are starting to take on ecologists as well. And there's definitely a diversity within the sectors uh, and that collaboration is going to be fundamental to a successful net gain project. Which brings us next into, you mentioned leading partnerships and managing partnerships with Future Homes Hub, RSPB. Can we dig a little bit deeper into those partnerships? Can you, can you say a little bit more about how they support your work, your plans? Yes, yeah, for sure. RSPB, so I'll start with that partnership. We've had that one for, well, going on eight eight years now, I think. And there are conservation partners. They help us see beyond biodiversity net gain. They look at how we can start to integrate biodiversity features into the built environment. So not just looking at habitat and landscape, obviously that's important because if we're putting swift nesting bricks and bat bricks and everything into our homes. They need somewhere to go and find food and, and water and so on and so forth. But yeah, they've really uh, helped us think beyond that legal requirement and what else we can be doing within our developments, hedgehog highways and things like that. So it's been a really lovely partnership to have uh, and they're very, they're very supportive um, for of all the initiatives and ideas that we've come up with and they've helped us along the way with those. Um, but we've also got that wider partnership. It's less of a partnership, more of a collaboration, I would say, with the, the Future Homes Hub. Um, it's a sector-wide initiative. It brings together all sizes of uh, house builders. Um, and we've worked together with DEFRA, DLUC, and Planning Advisory Service as well to look at the legislation, to look at the guidance and see how it is it can be applied to all these different sectors from planning and to, to the development sector down to management companies as well. And, and think all of those things through so we can come up with some effective uh, guidance that is that is pragmatic yeah brilliant i mean i think in in our pre-chat you talked about educational programs can you say a little bit more about oh yeah so we had through the future homes up we we set up a, a number of webinars to introduce different businesses to what what the biodiversity net gain process was obviously some of the majors have had biodiversity specialists within the companies for a number of years now so it was an opportunity for us to say this is where we've got to this is how it's working and and hopefully there's other businesses have, have benefited from some of that insight and does that does that also work with the, the folks buying the property you can design the nice garden and the hedgerows the hedgehogs the highways and the swift bricks, the bat bricks, but I'm guessing that once you've moved on, how do you maintain the success of that plan? Mm. Like it's, homeowners have got to be part of the, the journey somewhere. 
completely agree. That is, yeah, uh, we've got a site called Kingsbrook. It's one of our flagship sites that RSPB have been heavily involved with from the beginning. And even on that site, we had to do a lot. Of, and that, that site was primarily all around biodiversity. And it was pre-biodiversity net game, but we basically plastered it with all of these amazing kind of biodiversity uh, initiatives, Swift Bricks, Bat Bricks, House Martin Cups, and we've got biodiverse suds everywhere. We've got orchards. We've got meadow grass and all, the whole place is just amazing but even there we still had to do some form of education I don't want to call it education I want to call it like awareness raising of what the benefits were for all of these different spaces to the homeowner so even though they bought into this, this uh, idea there was still some level of this is areas meant for these types of species and this and we have to bring homeowners along in the journey that this is they're going to be the custodians I keep saying this they are the custodians of these sites going forward so if they don't understand or don't know about the different initiatives within those developments then we, we've already lost I think and and of course the more that you talk to people about these these different initiatives and the habitats and the biodiversity around their site the more they recognize and the more they understand and actually start to care for it as well and become quite yeah they, they care for it want want to look after it so yeah it's it's important so for all of our new homeowners who have either swift bricks or bat boxes or hedgehog highways through their back gardens they all get uh, i guess within their welcome pack they'll get uh, a sheet about what the swift brick does and if they see swifts to contact the rspb so it's nice it's just another way of communicating with new homeowners about the richness that they might see in terms of biodiversity around their sites i'm guessing that goes back through that partnership route then telling you that initiative has been successful it's worth doing again and again on the next development yeah um, it, exactly no, yeah we've the, the the feedback that we get has been positive we've not had we've yeah not had negative reports around the, the stuff that we've been putting in because you, you you need to let people know i think if it's a surprise to them it's different they'll question it query it but if they know that it's there for a reason, then that helps. Signage is going to be really crucial, I think, going forward for biodiversity net gain around development. That's a great point, actually. I'd, I'd never heard of bat bricks before or swift bricks or hedge, hedgehog highways until we first met. Tell us a little bit more about how you're using innovation to find these new solutions. Where's that coming from? How are you finding the right innovative approaches? Steve, as we're already looking at remote surveying to help get us, to give us that head start to understand. I've talked about biodiversity considerations having to be made right at the beginning of the development life cycle. So right when you start looking at land, we need to have a, a much better understanding of what, what's there, what's important, what are the constraints and the opportunities around biodiversity uh, on our sites so that we can start to layer up our kind of layouts and areas that we're going to do these different types of the things in. Um, so remote s surveying has been crucial, uh, or at least it's, it's starting to generate a lot of information and data that we can that we can use at that very early days look and we're hoping what we're really hoping for is that this is going to help us to apply the mitigation hierarchy more effectively at the outset of our planning and so we can demonstrate that if we can apply it we can demonstrate that to local planning authorities and give them the narrative behind why our design looks like this and why we've gone for this type of habitat here it's not it's yeah it's it we can talk a bit more about uh, that as well but i think the other types of innovation that we've looked at we talked about swift nesting bricks as an example the swift nesting brick that we use a lot is called the manthorpe swift uh, nesting brick it was designed in conjunction with ourselves rspb in action for swifts as well as manthorpe building supplies um and the reason we went we wanted to get in this swift nesting brick is because a lot of them out on the market were quite big they were heavy they didn't fit neatly into the kind of the row of bricks so we came up with this problem and the solution was this newly light made out of recycled plastic swift nesting brick and we use that now but that was a number of years ago 
fast forward now we're using more timber frame buildings we're, we're erecting timber frame so we're having to change the swift nesting brick to fit better within that so they've come up with a new design again meets all of the rspb action for swift's kind of needs in terms of what it should do but that sort of thing is always going to have to constantly be changing as our buildings change so we're going to have to change how we think about how we can incorporate these different things into our, our buildings as well I mean, and just on another point actually around landscaping one of the things that we need to think about from an innovation point of view is probably not innovation it's just thinking more strategically and long term about landscaping so uh, what information do we need to uh, ensure that our planting is successful and is going to remain there for the next 30 years or as long as we can possibly 30 years minimum so taking into account different types of data to be able to so whether it's soil samples or whether it's understanding the local climate and how that climate's going to change in the future as well so not necessarily like innovation but it's bringing in different types of data to support decision making going on and again, up front and early. Like, yeah. you mentioned that you're one of the first people I've ever come across which made this distinction between remote surveying and sensing. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit, just so the audience understands, how you differentiate between remote surveying and remote sensing? Yeah, I don't know if it's right or not, but I, I think remote surveying is the sort of thing that you do once off. That one, well, not once off, but you do it once every so often. You survey the, the, the area and you use AI and satellite imagery and so on and so forth, the LIDAR to assess what, what's there. The remote sensing is what you would use for monitoring. It's something you could do more regularly. So acoustic monitoring, eDNA, air monitors, quality, air quality monitors. It's the sort of thing that's going to become really important in understanding how well our environment is responding to all this good stuff that we're going to be doing in and around our development. We're going to need to start using a lot more of this to ensure that actually this the biodiversity net gain process is actually moving things in the right direction yeah yeah, yeah. which then, then means bringing all that data together doesn't it so it's, it's how do you pull these different data streams together to see are we on the dashboard are we seeing where we expected to see yeah. as we move forward into that 30 year period you mentioned using remote surveying to gain early insights into risks and opportunities can you just walk us through a little bit about how you use that information what yeah, essentially, it's about finding constraints and opportunities early. So what I mean by that is finding the most ecologically sound and probably cost effective way to deliver a biodiversity net gain project. Um, we've actually demonstrated that the earlier you start to think about biodiversity net gain, to consider those constraints and opportunities, and the more, more cost effective these projects are, you, you just cannot retrofit biodiversity net, gain, biodiversity net gain schemes into development. It's just not possible. It's not good for biodiversity and it's not good for a business's bottom line either because you're going to have to lose something that you've already planned for and that you thought that was possible, but you're going to have to pay for an offset potentially now because you can't accommodate it on site. So the earlier you, you do this, so that, that remote serving does give us that early doors look, but it, it does need to be verified by an ecologist. I think it gives us a really good starting point, a head start. As I mentioned, we're probably a good percentage of the way there in terms of our understanding of the, those constraints and opportunities. But we need that ecologist to go and confirm that and fine tune it potentially and give us the information on what is possible, what isn't possible by way of habitat creation going forward on those sites too. Too true. And let me just ask you, what would an ideal solution look like for how you would work with that data set and how you would manage yeah. it? Do you do that before it goes to the architect, before you decide what building design, the layouts and all the rest of it? Is that as early as that? Yeah, no, that's the that they, they that information is crucial for, for your urban designer. And they they need that information to determine. So one of the things that we do, and I'm sure others do it as well, is they kind of heat map a site okay they're not ecologists they're not but I've just said this area over here is red which means it's a no-go don't put any houses in this area because it's really important so that that's the kind of information that's how we use that information essentially to help inform that but yeah I think the main solution a good solution is really going to help us communicate with all of the stakeholders that are needed to deliver a biodiversity net gain and look 
there's going to be huge amounts of data, huge amounts of information generated, stored, and needing to be retrieved at some point over that 30-year lifespan of the Biodiversity Net Game Project. We that's How do you manage that? How do you manage that kind of foresight uh, and all the way along from it being produced, submitted, and then managed, uh, and making sure that everybody that's involved in that has easy access to it? Yeah. Interesting you said about sharing the data. Is that just internally within Barrett? So you're thinking once global 30 years it's being shared with the management development uh, company? Yeah, and how many management companies is it yes. being shared with? That's <laughs> it, it's not going to just stay in it, yeah. Obviously at the beginning, that's not necessarily for external consumption. It's for us to, to make decisions based on what we have and what's there but going forward there's yeah it's going to be accessed by goodness knows how many companies who are going to be looking after that site and um, let me move on to another topic and there, so there's a number of different remote serving options i'm sure they'll mature what do you see in the near horizon what's the where's the technology moving us towards what is what can you see the value of the innovation you're seeing coming through right now what would you like to see in the next 12 months, two years, three years and beyond. Yeah, I, I think I've touched on it. It is really just that data management and thinking about how to get better at um, building confidence in the, the data that we're receiving from remote surveys, uh, employing more of that remote sensing data so that we can start generating some information and monitoring on our site. Uh, we very rarely go back and do full-scale monitoring on our developments after we've left and that's a shame because we did it once with uh, Kingsbrook the RSPB went back and did a survey there a species survey and they identified that the house sparrow nesting had gone up by 3,000 percent because of those swift nesting bricks that we've been putting in no swifts there yet but the house sparrows were having a great time we can really I think just trying to make that much more regular thing so that we can learn and find out whether the the, the implementation of these things are, is actually having a positive benefit to biodiversity and that's what this is about i think yeah so we mentioned about that that and going into more species monitoring but also ecosystem services starting to get a better handle on what that looks like i think we need to look at how we can start to be a lot more strategic in our understanding i've talked about biodiversity offsets being more strategic and making sure they're in the right places as well and then obviously longer term we're going to have to start thinking about the task force for nature related financial disclosures and that wider impact too at some point so yeah i can see technology and, and different innovations happening in all of these different areas to make it easier for us to understand our impact and similarly how we mitigate for those things Fantastic. I'm going to ask you just a couple of last questions before we close out and ask the audience questions. But what do you see the next 12 months? What is the what do you see as the, the kind of core challenges, innovation things which you'd like to see adopted? What's next for Barrett's for this next 12 months? Oh, next for Barrett's. I think I can probably answer more for the sector to be well, from Barrett perspective, but also for the sector too. I think it's going to, there's going to be a lot of challenges. It's going to be very bumpy uh, for the next 12 months, I should think. Um, as we enter into this biodiversity net gain world, it's going to be busy and very challenging for a lot of businesses and their consultants as well, as we all try and get to grips with this similar local planning authorities is going to be there's going to be challenges there as they try and understand the information the wealth of information that we're going to be giving to them to help them make these decisions but i do think it's going to smooth out i'm, a, I'm an eternal optimist i really hope we get to see better link cups with the nature recovery strategies nature recovery areas and as i mentioned much better strategic planning for biodiversity and ecosystem services as well i hope that kind of mapping starts to to come to the fore so that we can start to make much better and more re refined decisions based on that and uh, designing for climate change i think is going to have to come into play as well so that we can ensure that those habitats are going to be there for the long term and fundamentally helping the species adapt to what is going to be a very changeable climate in the next few years. So, yeah, that's where I'm, I'm seeing things going. Fantastic. Any last tips for our audience? I know we've got a lot of developers on the call. 
Yeah, so developers, look, start having biodiversity net gain conversations with your consultants. Uh, Start getting your heads around the legal requirements. There's a lot of good information out there. Future Homes Hub has has some good information. Similarly, the Planning Advisory Service website has got great frequently asked questions. Um, You can get loads of information from there as well. So, yeah, there's reach out, start asking questions and and trying to figure out how best you're going to do this on your sites now. Yeah, by Monday. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Thank you. I'm going to summarize my key takeaways here, which were biodiversity planning needs to start with the context and the integration with that wider plan. I think you mentioned it around uh, local nature recovery strategy at the end there and how you bring that into the play. But early identification of risks and opportunities seemed like it was a critical thing and doing it really early, actually, a lot earlier than I imagined, actually. The innovation which you've, you've described here comes really out to play in terms of the, the need to address the losses, the need to be protecting more than just key species, which is what the design of BNG is there, but actually looking at what you can build into the design and how the design... And then they used to look at... Uh, a little bit beyond the immediate location for planning as well as biodiversity and policy perhaps matures. And I think you were touching, touching a little bit about that on that longer term aspect of using the surveying to assess perhaps some of the TNFD risks on the near horizon as well, which is fascinating in its own right. And who knows, we, we may end up with a scope three for biodiversity rather than just carbon. But um, I, I'm gonna, before we open up to final questions, I don't normally give a little plug, but I have got a, a, a message here, a short message from our sponsor today, which is to say AI Bash, as I think mostly provide BNG services. And as of today, I've gone live with a new platform, um, which you can access if you go into Google and just type in bng.ai. You can see it on my screen at the top here. You'll get lots of useful information about what we're saying about BNG, but also we can help facilitate a full BNG project life cycle. And the and we'll take it through from the beginning all the way to the end of that submission to planning. Uh, and the first projects are free up to 10 hexes. So do check it out on the website. We're going to turn ourselves now, if that's okay, to questions from the audience. So I'm going to bring some of those up from the chat function in here. And we've got some Q&A as well. Does Helen BNG affect site density? All right. Good question. Does, does BNG... This this site density an issue? The site dynamics uh, are some sites easier than others when you look at BNG development plans. Um, yeah, is yeah. urban easier or harder? <laughs> um, yeah, it's a strange question. It's not strange. It's it's one that I get asked quite a lot, but it's still coming at the wrong way. We've got to think about biodiversity first, and then think about how many plots you can get onto that site. So biodiversity, again, affects density, depending on what your baseline is. Um, so if you're thinking that you're going in and the site's got the uh, ability to put 50, 100 houses on it, you're still thinking about it the wrong way. You've got to think, what's the impact to the biodiversity? Where's the, the important bits for biodiversity? Where do we want to avoid? What's left? Okay, how many houses can we get on that? That's the way around it's got to be thought, thought about now, I think. I think there was a comment in, in the chat as well. There will be a Scottish metric in the future. Thank you for that, Hannah. And let's just have a quick look back at these. You actually know that, but I wasn't sure whether it was it, it'd been, it had been made public <laughs> yet. So it is now. Thanks, Hannah. Hannah, you voted it. <laughs> <laughs> let's have a quick look at the other questions in here. Credit to Barrett for the Biodiversity Initiative, for Swift Bricks and that box. Swift Bricks, no. Yeah, they don't count for it's Biodiversity Net Gain. No, they don't. For good reason. It's very difficult to monitor whether or not they're having a positive impact. Just because you put them in doesn't necessarily mean, as we've demonstrated in uh, Kingsbrook, that Swift are going to actually move in. But we've had an impact on house sparrow populations. And somewhere in the country, there might be Swifts benefiting from those boxes that get put in, but it's a very difficult one to monitor. But yeah, it, so that's why just because you do biodiversity net gain, you shouldn't forget about the fact that we've still got declining Swift populations. We've got declining many red listed species in our country that we need to do additional things for. It's not just about getting your net gain scores up there. Thank you. An interesting question here from David. I'm not quite sure if this is really going to have a massive impact to be honest, David, but you said, do new BNG regulations come into place at a certain time on the 12th? Uh, I, I'm going to I'm going to answer and just say, I, I would assume for one minute past midnight, I assume it's just on that day is, is when it's going to yeah. 
that's it exactly so yeah and do applications have to be validated before the requirements come in or just after they're submitted i think it's anything which you've submitted after the on the 12th submitted. or after it's yeah. submitted anything that's been submitted after the 12th yeah and the last question in here is how important do you think that off-site BNG units will be? Is it going to be a big market? Where's yeah. <laughs> the, <laughs> that and also how it depends how much land has he got. Yeah, obviously somebody with a with an interest there. But I yeah, it really just depends. It just depends how people approach this. Will it be a big market? I think it will be I think it will get to a, a threshold. For sure, but then there's going to be other things that come into play as well. I think we're going to see wider environmental markets come into play, not just biodiversity. I think there's going to be other ecosystem services that could be that could be traded at some point, not traded, that could be credits for different types of ecosystem services in the future. And it's likely to be varied right across the country. And imagine if you've got an area where it's densely populated already, then yeah. the value of credits could be quite competitive. Yeah. Um, Wonderful. Thank you, Helen, so much. We're almost at the top of the hour. I just wanted to say one final thank you for coming to the show today and being our first guest of season two. Thank you. Thank My, you for having me. You're welcome. And for everybody else on the call, please come and tune in again roughly this time next month. We'll have a new date for the next show coming up. But thank you very much and we'll bring the show to a close.